The Russian Revolution by Rosa Luxemburg, Chapter 4, The Constituent Assembly. Let us test this matter further by taking a few examples. The well-known dissolution of the Constituent Assembly in November 1917 played an outstanding role in the policy of the Bolsheviks. This measure was decisive for their further position. To a certain point, it represented a turning point in their tactics. It is a fact that Lenin and his comrades were stormily demanding the calling of a constituent assembly up to the time of their October victory, and that the policy of ragging out this matter on the part of the Kerensky government constituted an article in the indictment of that government by the Bolsheviks and was the basis of some of their most violent attacks upon it. Indeed, Trotsky says in his interesting pamphlet from October uh, from October to Brest Litova, Lit Litovsk, that the October Revolution represented the salvation of the Constituent Assembly, as well as the, of the revolution as a whole. And when we said, he continues, that the entrance to the Constituent Assembly could not be reached through the preliminary parliament of Zaratelli, but only through the seizure of power by the Soviets, we were entirely right. And then after these declarations, Lenin's first step after the October Re Revolution was the dissolution of this, this same constituent assembly to which it was supposed to be an entrance. What reasons could be decisive for so astonishing a turn? Trotsky in the above mentioned pamphlet discusses the matter thoroughly and we will set down his argument here. Trotsky said, While the months preceding the October Revolution were a time of leftward movement on the part of the masses and of an elemental flow of workers, soldiers, and peasants towards the Bolsheviks, inside the Socialist Revolutionary Party this process expressed itself as a strengthening of the left wing at the cost of the right. But within the list of party candidates of the Socialist Revolutionaries, the old names of the right wing still occupied three-fourths of the places. Then there was the further circumstance that the elections themselves took place in the course of the first weeks after the October Revolution. The news of the change that had taken place spread rather slowly in concentric, concentric circles from the capital to the provinces and from the towns to the villages. The peasant masses in many places had little notion of what went on in Petrograd and Moscow. They voted for land and freedom and elected as the representatives um, in the land committees those who stood under the banner of the Narodniki. Thereby, however, they voted for Kerensky and Avginstiev, who had been dissolving these land committees and having their members arrested. This state of affairs gives a clear idea of the extent to which the Constituent Assembly had lagged behind the development of the political struggle and the development of party groupings. All of this is very fine and quite convincing, but one cannot help wondering how such clever people as Lenin and Trotsky failed to arrive at the conclusion which follows immediately from the above facts. Since the Constituent Assembly was elected long before the decisive turning point, the October Revolution and its composition reflected the picture of the vanished past and not of the new state of affairs. Then it follows automatically that the outgrown and therefore stillborn Constituent Assembly should have been annulled and without delay. New elections to a new Constituent Assembly should have been arranged. They did not want to entrust, nor should they have entrusted, the fate of the revolution to an assemblage which reflected the Kerenskian Russian of yesterday, of the period of vacillations and coalitions with the bourgeoisie. Hence, there was nothing left to do except to in convoke an assembly that would issue forth out of the renewed Russia that had advanced further. Instead of this, from the special inadequacy of the Constituent Assembly, which came together in October, Trotsky draws a general conclusion concerning the inadequacy of any popular representation whatsoever, which might come from universal popular elections during the revolution. 
Thanks to the open and direct struggle for governmental power, he writes, the laboring masses acquire in the shortest time an accumulation of political experience, and they climb rapidly from step to step in their political development. The bigger the country and the more rudimentary its technical apparatus, the less is the cumbersome mechanism of democratic institutions able to keep pace with this development. Here we find the mechanism of democratic institutions, as such called in question. To this we must at once object that in such an estimate of representative institutions, there lies a somewhat rigid and schematic conception which is expressly contradicted by the historical experience of every revolutionary epoch. <coughs> According to Trotsky's theory, every elected assembly reflects once and for all the only only the mental composition, political maturity and mood of its electorate just at the moment when the latter goes to the polling place. According to that, a democratic body is the reflection of the masses at the end of the electoral period, much as the heavens of Herschel always show as the heavenly bodies, not as they are when we are looking at them, but as they were at the moment they sent out their light messages to the earth from the measureless distances of space. Any living mental connection between the representatives, once they have been elected, and the electorate, any permanent interaction between one and the other is hereby denied. Yet how all historical experience contradicts this? Experience demonstrates quite the contrary, namely that the living fluid of the popular mood continuously flows around the living fluid of the popular mood continuously flows around the representative bodies. What the fuck? Penetrates them, guides them. How else would it be possible to witness, as we do at times in every bourgeois parliament, the amusing capers of the people's representatives, who are suddenly inspired by a new spirit and give forth quite unexpected sounds, or to find the most dried out mummies at times com comforting themselves like youngsters, and the most diverse little Shaden mansion <laughs> suddenly finding revolutionary tones in their breasts whenever there is rumbling in factories and workshops on the street. And is this ever living influence of the mood and degree of political ripeness of the masses upon the elected bodies to be renounced in favor of a rigid scheme of party emblems and tickets in the very midst of revolution? Quite the contrary. It is precisely the revolution which creates by its glowing heat the delicate, vibrant, sensitive political atmosphere in which the waves of popular feeling, the pulse of popular life, work for a moment on the representative bodies in most wonderful fashion. It is on this very fact, to be sure, that the well-known moving scenes depend which invariably present themselves in the first stages of every revolution scenes in which old reactionaries or extreme moderates who have issued out of a parliamentary election by limited suffrage under the old regime suddenly become the heroic stormy spokesman of the uprising the classic example is provided by the famous long parliament in england which was elected and assembled 16 in 1642 and remained at its post for seven whole years and reflected in its internal life all alterations and displacements of popular feeling, of political ripeness, of class differentiation, of the progress of the revolution to its highest point, from the initial devout skirmishes with the crown under a speaker who remains on his knees, to the abolition of the House of Lords, the execution of Charles and the proclamation of the Republic. And was not the same wonderful transformation repeated in the French Estates General, and the censorship, censorship subjected parliament of Louis Philippe, and even, and this last most striking example was very close to Trotsky, even in the fourth Russian Duma, which elected in the year of grace 1909, <coughs> under the most rigid rule of the counter-revolution, suddenly felt the glowing heat of the impending overturn and became the point of departure for the revolution. All this shows that the cumbersome mechanism of democratic institutions possesses a powerful corrective, namely the living movement of the masses, their unending pressure. 
And the more democratic the institutions, the livelier and stronger the pulse beat of the political life of the masses, the more direct and complete is their influence. Despite rigid party banners, outgrown tickets, electoral lists, etc., to be sure, every democratic institution has its limits and shortcomings, things which it doubtless, doubtless shares with all other human institutions. But the remedy which Trotsky and Lenin have found, the elimination of democracy as such, is worse than the disease it is supposed to cure, for it stops up the very living source from which alone can come correction of all the innate shortcomings of social institutions. That source is the active, untrammeled, energetic political life of the broadest masses of the people.